Hi, I'm your host, Becky Davis, and you're watching GardenWise, Santa Barbara's most informative show about sustainable landscaping. We all know the drought has taken a toll on landscapes across Santa Barbara County. As we continue into the winter months and hope for more rain, now's the perfect time to consider replacing your lawn with WaterWise plants. Up next, we take you through the entire process of retrofitting your landscape to make it more WaterWise. Many residents throughout Santa Barbara County have let their landscapes go gold in an effort to conserve water during the drought. Now that we're entering what we hope to be as the rainy season, it's the perfect time to transform your landscape into something more water-wise. The first step is to assess your current landscape and consider how you'd like it to be used. I think the first thing to do is to consider, do you use that lawn space or is it sort of a place that you just look out onto? Do you have children or dogs? Um, so I think one question is, would you want to replace the lawn or make it smaller with a, with a different type of lawn, like a native lawn, like a buffalo grass or something like an agrostis, a dune bent grass that uses less water than traditional turf. So that's one thing. If it's a space that's not used, such as a parkway or a narrow front yard that's not being used for children or dogs or activities, then I would look to replacing it with water-wise plants, Mediterranean garden style plants that really fit the Santa Barbara landscape style. After assessing your landscape and determining what you want to do with it, the next step is planning and design. Whether you're doing it on your own or hiring a professional, there are four main things you should know ahead of time. Your needs, desires, restrictions, and budget. The smartest thing to do is to come up with a plan first. Um, it's fine to let your lawn go brown and let it stay there, but as soon as you scrape it off, then you have dust and erosion issues. Um, so it's, it, you're probably better off to just leave the dead lawn sitting in place. And a lot of times with the rain, it's just gonna grow back, especially if it has a Kikuyu or Bermuda base, it's gonna pop right back and turn green within a couple days. Um, if it's a fescue, it may be dead. Um, so then in that case, you would want to move forward with planning something for the garden. Um, typically what we do is I'll ask a client how they want to use the space. Do they want just a garden or do they want an outdoor dining space or an area to play such as a bocce ball court um, or a patio? And then from there, we start selecting garden styles. We look at how they want to incorporate an indoor-outdoor living environment. We look at plant palettes, and then we really start the design process by creating the space that they're looking for. Once a plan has been developed, it's time to determine when implementation should take place. This is the perfect time of year to be seeding natives um, because you can rely on the natural rainfall pattern. If you're looking at native California native plants, again, they really like to be watered um, and planted in the fall and winter. It's a perfect time so that they can establish as we're getting our natural rainfall. And we are predicted to get some good rains this year, so it's an ideal time to be planting. Um, you don't want to plant when your soil is too wet, so you want to grab the soil and squeeze it. And if it's coming out in a really long, mucky ball, that means your soil's too wet. If you squeeze it and it's cr lightly crumbly, then you're probably safe to plant. After determining when the best time to plant is, you can prepare for installation by working on improving your soil. I think one thing that's really important when you are switching your lawn over to a garden space, typically if you've been using the lawn or it's been there for a very long time, the soil is going to be quite compacted. And this really goes for any, any place, especially new construction, where there's been heavy equipment on the, on the soil and it's really compacted it. Um, your garden's only going to be as happy and healthy as the soil. And the soil is one of the most important pieces of a garden. There's a number of sources that you can get compost from. Either make it yourself, you can buy compost tea from City College, um, you can buy pre-made compost. There's a number of places and the building, the building construction yards in town will, will sell it. And you can incorporate that probably a couple inches is good. Um, if it's really bad heavy clay soil, you might want to consider three inches or so. Just spread it out and incorporate that into the soil. And that, that helps aerate the soil. And, and what that does is it helps um, when, when we do get rain and if you do irrigate, it helps retain moisture in the soil rather than having the rain hit this really compacted soil and just run right off. 
Also, it helps establish um, a biological community in the soil, which can help bring nutrients to the plant roots. So it's really creating a whole life, earthworms, different insects, mycorrhizae, fungi, beneficial things, or it's a whole ecosystem that's happening under the ground. Another thing that's really important that I can't stress enough is mulch. Um, a good, nice, thick layer of wood chip mulch. I always recommend to start with four inches because it does, it does shrink down and compact. And that breaks down and continues to help build this nice organic layer. The better your soil is, the less water you're going to have to use. The mulch in there really helps maintain that soil biology by reducing extremes of heat and cold. And it also maintains moisture level so you're not having to water as much. Once you've developed a healthy ecosystem for your garden, you're ready to begin planting and installing proper irrigation. Irrigation systems are one of the most important pieces of the puzzle of sustainable gardening. There's a number of older systems around that are fixed spray systems and they often overspray onto hardscapes and, and those are, are types of heads that are really starting to phase out and they only have about a 60% efficiency which means if you put a hundred gallons through the pipe only 60 gallons is actually getting to your plants and you're essentially wasting 40 gallons of water and that can be to wind drift and misting and overspray so switching over to a water wise garden which you ideally you want to get that over to a drip system the trick with drip systems is they really need to be checked and maintained um, you can't just install it and then walk away um, i recommend at least once a month during the the summer when you're irrigating to turn on your system check it make sure none of the emitters have popped out and that everything's working perfectly and that's really the most efficient way to irrigate plants or if you're doing a meadow or changing to a water wise um, lawn substitute you may want to look at doing um, MP rotator heads because as they have larger droplets and they rotate around so that there's not as much wind drift and it actually gets down into the soil and that's especially important in our region a lot of our soils are very clay and these MP rotator heads have a lower precipitation rate meaning they put water out at a lower rate so that the soil has time to soak it up rather than being saturated and creating runoff which is what happens a lot with these fixed spray nozzles um, so that's those are two really important ideas the last step to retrofitting your landscape and perhaps the most enjoyable is sitting back and reaping the benefits of having a water-wise garden. I'll put it this way. When we first bought our house, we had a lawn in the front and a lawn in the back. And, and I have a push mower, and I can't tell you what a pain in the butt it was every weekend to spend half of a Saturday mowing and edging and raking and composting and doing all of those chores. Um, with my water-wise garden, um, maybe once a month I go out there and do some deadheading. Um, there's a little bit more weeding this time of the year, especially after the first rainfall. And then I basically get to sit back and enjoy it. Um, I can enjoy flowers and birds and wildlife. So it's really a lot less maintenance mm -hmm. and, and a lot more enjoyment. If you've been waiting to introduce new plants into your landscape because of the drought, now during the rainy season is the perfect time to do it. Need inspiration? Visit any of these demonstration gardens. From ripping out a lawn to installing drip irrigation, there are plenty of ways to save water in your landscape. Up next, we take a look at what a few local residents have done to recycle the water they're already using. Gray water. One of the simplest, most cost-effective ways to create a more sustainable landscape is to install a laundry-to-landscape gray water system. But you may be wondering, what exactly is gray water? Gray water is any water that's already been used and it's gone down the drain of, for example, the washing machine, 
the bathroom sink, the shower, dark gray water, or sometimes it's called black water, is toilet water and kitchen sink and dishwasher water. So that's generally not hooked up to any gray water system. The more common is definitely the laundry because it's one of the easiest, and then also shower or bathroom sink. You can reduce the amount of water that you use in a shower. You can reduce the amount of water that you use to do dishes. The washing machine uses the amount of water that it uses, and that water will always be there. And instead of sending it out to the ocean, that water can keep your crucial landscape plants alive. To encourage residents to install a laundry to landscape system in their yard, an informative lecture was held at the Public Library in Santa Barbara, followed by a hands-on workshop. Both lecture and workshop were led by local gray water guru Art Ludwig, in collaboration with a local organization called Sweetwater Collaborative. While the lecture was open to the public, this particular workshop was available only for professionals. It's a workshop geared for installers who want to learn how to put these in so they can then replicate it at other properties. Many of the people here have already been involved in gray water. Some of them, it's their first introduction to it but this is a hands-on workshop so they can lay out all the pipes, lay out the drip tubing, see which plants are gonna be watered, and then put the whole system in. This is a specific workshop that's open to professionals and we're gonna have another rainwater harvesting that's for professionals. And so the way that we explain things, we're trying to teach people to do this on, a, on scale. Most of our workshops are open to the community. You don't have to be a homeowner. Um, you can come and learn. The, Homeowner does have to pay for the instructor's time, the preparation, the design, and the materials. This particular Laundry to Landscape workshop was held at the home of Nancy and Isaac, who have been interested in sustainable landscaping for many years. We are thrilled that we get to have this happen at our house. We wanted to have a great water system and, and uh, also water harvesting to collect water from the roof. And we're very thrilled to share the experience with, uh, with 16 people who are going to share it with many more people. In the span of one day, 16 workshop participants got hands-on experience installing a laundry to landscape system that runs from the laundry room to the front yard. This is a permit-free system. It's permit-free th free throughout the state of California. Basically, we use the power of the washing machine pump to get the gray water out into the environment and we use flexible hoses so it's a much more forgiving system and it can be a, a modified over time. So right now basically we've divided into three groups and the first thing that you have to do is you have to do the indoor plumbing in the laundry room. You need a three-way valve so that you always have the ability to turn between the sewer or septic and the gray water system. Um, and then this is going to be run into two different zones. So we have another three-way valve on the outside. So all of that has to be plumbed and the hole has to be drilled through and then it comes out. And then what we're doing, because we're running it through a place where there's a small amount of concrete, we have to do some drilling. Um, we're not boring through the concrete, but we're just opening up the top of the concrete and then often there's um, tile or they're going to be putting brick on top. We usually have some different instructors with small groups and then we switch so that everybody has a chance to work on each part of the project. Although gray water is great for reuse in your landscape, it should only be used to water certain plants. Fruit trees are generally the best thing or the, the priority thing to keep alive because they're productive as well as being beautiful and aesthetic and providing privacy, helping to find outdoor living space. Typically, it's fruit trees and ornamentals would be the priorities to water. Annuals are not a good choice, and vegetable gardens are not a good choice because it's prohibited to have gray water come in contact with the edible parts of the plant, so like potatoes, beets, carrots, lettuce, strawberries, all those things cannot be watered with gray water. When using gray water in your yard, it's important to use gray water safe soaps and detergents. When you're using a laundry to landscape system, there's two um, important factors when you're talking about plant health and washing your clothes because sometimes they aren't gonna work together. So one thing that you put in at the back of your washing machine is a three-way valve. So you can decide if you want it to go to the landscape or to the sewer. For example, if you're washing whites and you wanna use bleach, you do not wanna put that out on your plants. So you say that that part goes to the sewer. 
Um, also, when you are sending out to the landscape, you don't want to use regular detergent. You want to use a detergent that's biocompatible, and those are sold in quite a few stores here in Santa Barbara. So it's not biodegradable. It's actually called biocompatible. Another perk to installing a laundry to landscape system is that it's one of the cheaper ways to reuse water, which will save you money in the long run. Of the water reuse options, it's by far the cheapest and the most flexible. It uses lightweight, small diameter tubing that can be easily rerouted as conditions change. The gray water systems for gravity flow sources, like the shower, use large diameter tubing that's buried underground and has to be an exact slope so that it doesn't clog. So yeah, the laundry is relatively economical. Parts, $100, $200, and then labor, it's like under $1,000 to have the whole thing installed. These systems can be installed by either yourself or a professional. If you decide to do it yourself, there are many resources available to help. A handy homeowner could do this. There's an educational and instructional DVD available at the Santa Barbara Public Library and also from the City Water Conservation Department that explains in detail how to do the system. So someone who does basic home repair or things like that would have no problem putting together one of these systems. There's also a number of installers locally who can just come in and do a turnkey system. For people who are looking for more information and resources on gray water, we have a whole section on waterwisesb.org slash graywater. And also at the library, there's also a really good gray water book there that Art has written, and there's quite a few of those in circulation. So those are a really good place to start. Also, there's a group here in town. It's a nonprofit called Sweetwater Collaborative. They're helping with the workshop today, and they put on these hands-on workshops pretty commonly, I think once or twice a month. And so they do rainwater catchment, and they also do gray water. So people who want to get hands-on experience or have them come to their house, see if it's going to be feasible at their house, I encourage them to go to sweetwatercollaborative.org. For more information about gray water, visit waterwisesb.org slash graywater. We'll be right back with more Garden Wise. Meet the most fascinating man in the world. When droughts happen, water experts go to him for water saving actions. His front lawn requires no water because he replaced it with water wise plants. He only works two days a week, and so do his sprinklers. He uses so little water, overwatered plants seek refuge in his yard. I know a lot about saving water, but when I want to know more, I go to waterwisesp.org. Let's save together, my friends. We are in a serious drought, so it's time to get water wise. Did you know that in Santa Barbara County, 60% of residential water use is used in gardens, and half that is wasted through overwatering and runoff? Take a day off from watering your landscape and only water your thirstiest plants, such as your lawn, no more than two days a week. Gold is the new green in Santa Barbara County. Your water provider is here to help. Visit waterwisesb.org for more information. Welcome back. Another great way to conserve water in our semi-arid climate is to harvest rainwater during the wetter months. In our next segment, we take a look at a few locations that have installed rainwater systems on their properties and find out why they did. We began by visiting Santa Barbara City College to learn about what they've done throughout their campus. We've done several things. The new Humanity Building has a small bioswale rain harvesting directional uh, sink it, slow it, spread it uh, system. Uh, we've installed the rainwater harvesting active barrel system on the back of our facility shed as a, a demonstration, uh, which was a very cool project that we got to do in collaboration with Sweetwater. So we actually taught people how to install the systems uh, with eight or nine volunteers that would go out into the community and, and spread the word and then we got a free tank out of it by hosting the workshop. So by relying on these kind of community connections, we were able to improve our site, plus teach other people how to, to work on it as well. While rainwater harvesting systems are a great solution to maintaining landscapes during dry times, not all look the same. There are several different types of rainwater harvesting systems. There's passive and active systems. Uh, passive systems are more dynamic and the fact that they're not limited by size of pipe or the container that you have, which that's an active system. You would be pulling water off a roof and catching it in a rain barrel or something like that. 
but that limits you on size and amount that you can capture. Whereas a passive system, like we built at the Shot Center, it's dynamic, so it can take as much or as little water as the, the Earth has to offer us. So if uh, in ideal conditions, we can capture around 13,000 gallons of storm water in any given year. Um, and the plants that we planted in the storm system only require about 7,000 gallons of water in a storm year. So that's uh, between seven and 8,000 gallons of water savings each year. So our goal here is just knowing that lowering our water usage is a good idea as far as uh, environment and costs, etc. So that was really the, the main goal. And, and the garden that's behind me, for every inch of rain, we're collecting a thousand, roughly a thousand gallons of water that would have just flown out into the street and out to the ocean carrying pollution with it. So that, instead of um, polluting the environment, it's actually feeding and nurturing our plants here. From decreased water use to less maintenance, installing a rain garden has many benefits. Immediate values to us is we took out about 20% of our turf grass. Obviously turf grass being a large water consumer. Um, so that lowers our irrigation needs. Um, so immediately we saw improvements in water savings through our irrigation. Um, right now, so this, what used to be turf grass is now on drip. And once these uh, native and um, drought tolerant plants become um, established, we can turn that drip off for most of the year. So this eventually, which goes from little use of water, eventually go to like little to none. These systems not only benefit the property owner, but the entire community as well. The values community, I see it as one, this is like an educational site that anyone walking by can see and hope, you know, uh, educate themselves on what, what a water-friendly garden might look like and some options. Uh, some, uh, also options of, of some different variety of plants that you may or may not see. Um, it's also, we get more birds, uh, birds and insects that, you, that never were here before. Um, because there's a reason for them to be here. There's a variety of flowering plants that are now here. Fortunately, rainwater harvesting doesn't have to be as complicated as you'd think. As simple as putting a couple of barrels under your eave, it can start with that. That's actually rainwater harvesting, something that you can save and put a lid on after you've captured it, uh, to taking advantage of the city's rebate programs, to when you're putting in a native landscape, you can design things to help catch and slow down some of the storm water that's coming out of the downspouts from your house. That's the easiest way to start capturing storm water runoff. To show you just how simple it can be, we return to the home of Nancy and Isaac to check out the rainwater harvesting system being installed on their property in a single day. They are doing a rainwater harvesting workshop. So the city of Santa Barbara has organized for teachers and they are teaching landscape architects. They are harvesting the water into bioswales, uh, just rainwater, to take advantage of that for natural irrigation. At this workshop, four instructors led a group of professionals to install a number of rainwater basins throughout the property. We did some basins around other areas of the house that came from downspouts of the house and now they're going and being recycled and going around some of the fruit trees on the property. Instead of everything getting run off into the street, it's now going to water fruit trees during whatever rains we get. The purpose of the workshops are to educate local landscape professionals on how to incorporate these practices into their own businesses and collectively make Santa Barbara a more sustainable place. I want to start incorporating some of these um, concepts of rainwater harvesting and catchment basins and swales into landscapes and that we can marry something that's really practical with something that's really beautiful and save water all at the same time. For ideas on installing a rainwater system, visit a rain garden near you. Up next, we have another horrifying horticultural crime to solve with landscape architect and author, Billy Goodnick. The story you're about to see is true. The location of these plants has been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city, 
Santa Barbara, California. Some call it paradise. Mountains and ocean views, classic architecture and exotic gardens. But drive down any street in any neighborhood and you'll find them there, sometimes in broad daylight. People perpetrating pointlessly pitiful pruning on peaceful plants. My name is Billy Goodnick and I run the Crimes Against Horticulture Division. Actually, there's no such thing, but wouldn't it be cool if there were? My mission is to help my community create beautiful, useful, sustainable landscapes. Plants that don't look like a bunch of UFOs, meatballs, and hockey pucks. Tuesday afternoon, scorching Santa Ana winds, chasing my friend the fog monster to the islands. I was cooling myself when I noticed my fan was a file from a new and very disturbing case. Unfortunately, many of us had to put up with bullying when we were kids in school, but mature plants should know better. That's why we opened a case under plant code 247.8, harassment and intimidation with intent to stifle growth. Known for their gentle and artistic ways, this French lavender might have just sat quietly and waited for the Raphael Epis and the bush lavender to find somebody else to pick on. But no, these bullies just had to keep growing and squeezing and shading and putting the pressure on little Philippe. Beautiful low maintenance gardens start with proper plant selection. That means knowing how big a plant wants to get before deciding how much room to give them. For example, this French lavender grows at least four to five feet across. The marigold next to it grows at least six feet across. And here they are planted within a few feet of each other. Nothing but trouble, and there's really no way to avoid it other than hacking, pruning, and creating crimes against horticulture. It's easy to look at magazines and beautiful pictures and see completely filled in gardens, and a lot of people want that instantly, but that's not realistic in gardens. The idea is to space plants so that when they reach their mature size, that's when they cover. So if you're impatient, you need some quick fill, put in some ground covers, annuals, that sort of thing, until the other plants mature and fill the bed. So the lesson here is patience. Jane, looks like we solved another one. Tell you what, get this filed and uh, we'll go catch that new French movie at the air conditioned theater. Gotta cool off. Well, that does it for this episode of Garden Wise. Remember, together we can conserve water and create beautiful climate appropriate gardens. There are plenty of resources online to help. Visit waterwisesb.org for information or to view past episodes. If you have questions or comments about the show, you can give us a call at 564-5311. I'm your host, Becky Davis, and remember, keep it waterwise, Santa Barbara.